Jeremiah chapter 2, reading from verse 14 to verse 19. Let us read this passage together. Okay, if you are there, ready, reading. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitants. Also the children of North and Tahafenas have broken the crown of their head. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself? Thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way. And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt? To drink of the waters of Sihor? Or what dost thou to do in the way of Assyria? To drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy black siding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. Amen. And we thank the Lord for the reading of His holy word. This morning we have seen two evils. The evil of forsaking the Lord and the hewing of themselves cisterns. Now we have not meditated in detail concerning the second evil. But the second evil follows after the first evil of forsaking the Lord. And the Lord says that this is a very puzzling thing. When you look at verse 12, you see how the Bible says, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. The Lord calls upon the heavens to be witnesses of the crimes of the children of Israel in how they have forsaken the Lord. They are called upon to be astonished, to be horrified, to be in ruins because of such a thing that the people have done. And this thing that the people have done goes beyond logic, goes beyond reason. How is it that the people can forsake the fountain of living water? This fountain of living waters that they have tasted of, that has led them out of Egypt, that has given them life, how can they now turn and forsake this fountain of living waters? And the Lord will then show us from verse 14 to verse 19 that there are serious consequences in the forsaking of this fountain of living waters. And that is our meditation and our theme this evening, where the Lord shows us, as you forsake the fountain of living waters, you now hew out to yourself cisterns. Now, these cisterns would be sources of water, where you expect to find water. But the Bible says that these cisterns can hold no water. What we see today is more and more miserable young Christians who are trying to go around finding sources of water to drink from. But they are rotting away. They are drying out because there's no water to be found. The Bible doesn't even say that here they find, found dirty water. Now in other places, the Bible will say of how they drink of bitter water, that is water that is even poisonous. But here the Bible says that even this cisterns, they do not even have water found in them. Not a single drop of water that is found. Now they are going to dry up. They are going to die of thirst. Now you see how slowly they would rot away, but they will surely rot away. If you were to drink a bottle of poison, you would die very quickly, very soon. But to die of dehydration very slowly, and trying to search out for water, trying to search out something to quench your thirst and not find it. How terrible a feeling that would be. And that, the Bible says, will be the consequences of the people's forsaking. Now here this evening, what we are going to deal with is really on the theology of sin. And the Bible wants to show us the seriousness of sin. Now we have mentioned about that briefly yesterday evening. But now the Bible will go into detail to show us what the consequences of sin is. This is the theme of divine justice and chastisement which the Lord brings. 
And Christians need to realize that there are consequences to the choices that they make. When they forsake the fountains of living water, there are consequences that are to bear. Even as Christians, when we are born again, when the Lord Jesus Christ has died for our sins, yet in forsaking the fountains of living water, see that there are consequences to sin. Now, sometimes Christians may argue, but I have been sinning, and why is it that I do not experience any consequences to my sin? Now, we're going to talk about that in, a, in greater detail in a while. But one thing that we can say also with why some Christians may not bear or seem to bear consequences of sin is because it's only of the Lord's mercy. But please do not take the Lord's mercy as a license to continue in sin. Just because God has not meted out justice and judgment on you, just because you have not borne the effects, the consequences of sin, it is God who is merciful. Please do not see it as a license to continue in forsaking the fountain of living waters. Because when the wrath of God is now poured out, who can bear it? So from verse 14 to verse 19, our text this evening, we want to meditate on three things concerning these consequences of forsaking the Lord. The first thing we see is that there are consequences. The consequences are revealed from verse 14 to verse 16. The consequences are now revealed for us when the children of Israel forsook the Lord. What was the effect of their sin? Now the Lord brought out the consequences in a rhetorical question. Now rhetorical questions are very powerful devices that are meant to cause the people receiving the questions to think for themselves. You notice these questions that are asked in verse 14. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? Now when rhetorical questions are asked, oftentimes answers are not expected. Just like when the Lord here asked the children of Israel, why is he spoiled? Now the word spoiled here means to be plundered. The word spoiled, you see that in verse 14, has the idea of something that has been plundered. The Lord is asking the children of Israel, why is he now in such a state that he has become as one who is plundered or the plunder, the spoil of war? How is it that Israel has become the spoil of war? Now, what is this spoil of war? In the context here, the Bible is talking about slavery. Israel has become a servant. The word here, servant, properly means slavery, slave. But why the Bible here describes it as servant is because to distinguish it from the second one. Is he a homeborn? Now, the difference between a slave and a homeborn is a slave is a slave that has been bought from a market. Now, if you know a little bit about the history, of, the history of Israel and some of their cultural practices, which you also see in the book of Leviticus and Numbers, there are a few different kinds of slaves. One kind of slave is the kind of slave that you buy from the market. And then after seven years, the law commands that you must release this slave. He is free. But if this slave chooses to remain with you, then you would use a nail to pierce his ear as a mark that now he belongs to you and his family also will belong to you. And so a home-born slave here describes a slave that has been born in this family. That's the difference. So there are two kinds of slaves described here. A slave that is bought from the market and then a slave that is now born in the house and he continues as slave. And the Lord is now saying, Israel is become a slave. But the Lord asks it in a question, why is he spoiled? Why is he become, has he become the spoil of war, the prisoner of war that is now sold in the market? What has happened to the children of Israel? Because when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, that was not what God designed the children of Israel to be. But why has Israel fallen into such a state? The Lord asks it in a rhetorical question. The children of Israel must figure out themselves, must think for themselves. Why have we come to such a state? Why are we bearing the consequences of this sin? Then the consequences are continued to be reviewed. 
that the young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they make his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitants. Also the children of North and Tahaf Panes have broken the crown of thy head. Now they, we believe here that North and Tahaf Panes here could describe the Egyptians. They have broken the crown of thy head. The crown of thy head would describe the scalp. And this would describe the pride, the very precious place. It is Israel's glory. In other words, they have been devoured completely. They have been, here the lion would be descriptive also of both the Babylonians and the Assyrians. They have been completely destroyed, removed. In other words, God asked Israel, see the grave effects of sin, that Israel is now brought into slavery. See the far-reaching impact of sin. How far Israel has fallen when Israel was the pride and the glory of the Lord. But now, it has just become but a slave. It has to submit to a new master. Now, this immediately raises a very important theological point which we need to address. It is that there are consequences of sin. That even as Christians, even as Christians, when we sin, there are still consequences of sin that we have to bear. And this is also the, the question in your discussion yet, uh, for tomorrow. Hey, some Christians may wonder, if the Lord Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross for our sins, our sins past, present and future have been forgiven us, then why are there still consequences of sin? And we know for a fact that there are consequences of sin, even for believers. The Bible shows us very clearly. For example, in the Corinthian church, when they partook of the Lord's Supper unworthily, the Bible tells us many of them fell sick and many even did die. And we know that they are believers because the Bible there describes death as sleep. Many are fallen asleep. So when they partook of the Lord's Supper unworthily, they died. But the Bible used the term sleep to describe their kind of death because of the promise of the resurrection. So these are believers. But they had to bear the consequences of their sin. We also know that David had to bear the consequence of his sin when he sinned against Bathsheba, against the Lord with Bathsheba, even in the death of four of his sons. We know in the book of James, James chapter 5, verse 13 to verse 16, where you read of those who are sick, and then the Bible says, call on the elders that they come to pray for you and that if you confess your faults one to another, then the prayers of the righteous will be heard. There what James has showed us is that there are those who have fallen sick as a result of their sin. And the Lord so wills and is pleased that in repentance of sin, the Lord shows mercy even to deliver them from this sickness. Now, in other words, what we do see is that there are consequences of sin that believers also have to bear, even though their sin, past, present and future, are forgiven. So the question is, why are there consequences of sin? And this is what we need to understand about salvation. When God saved us through the Lord Jesus Christ, what did He save us from? And we also need to understand what did He save us from and when? We know that in justification, there are various aspects of salvation and this one aspect of sal salvation, which we call justification, is what we describe as positional, the positional aspect of salvation. It is where God has forgiven us of our guilt of sin. He has freed us from the guilt of sin. And when I use the word guilt there, I do not just simply mean the guilty feeling that a person has. But I mean guilt in a legal sense, where God has pardoned your guilt. You are no longer guilty. But God has also not delivered us, while we are on earth, from the presence of sin yet. Now, we know that God will surely deliver us from the presence of sin and completely from the power of sin when we are glorified and transformed. But while we are on earth, when we go through the sanctification process, 
we have not been delivered from the presence and the power of sin yet. We still have to wrestle with the flesh and the influence that is, is in the flesh. We have to mortify the flesh, mortify the old man. There is still the presence of sin. We are no longer under the bondage of sin, no longer under the power of sin whereby sin controls us, but sin still has its influence upon us. Now this also then shows us that when Christ died on the cross for our sins, He has on earth already forgiven us of all our guilt of sin. But we still have to bear the consequences of sin. And this is evidence in even the fact that we have to die. But our death is just but sleep. But the fact is, even now as Christians, if the Lord so tarries and does not return, when we die, we go to the ground. And then the Lord will one day deliver us completely from this physical death in the glorious resurrection. But we will still die while we are on earth. This is just but a semblance of the effects of sin because even physical death is as a consequence and a result of Adam's sin. In other words, we need to realize that there are far-reaching effects of sin. And God has so willed and allowed that while He has forgiven us of our sin, past, present and future, especially with reference to its guilt, He has so deemed it fit and necessary that we still have to bear the effects and the consequences of sin while we are on earth. And that's what Christians need to realize that sin has far-reaching impact and implications and many are still bearing the effects of sin even today. Even after we are born again, there are still consequences and effects of sin that we have to bear. Now immediately in your mind, some may then ask again another question with regard to sin. Now we are dealing with the theology of sin first. And I hope you have a proper understanding of this. Because some may ask again another question. They would quote Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 19 and 20, the Bible says here, Yet say ye, why does not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The question here is, the Bible tells us that the Father shall not bear the iniquity of the Son, and the Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father. Why then do we seem to see the effects of sin affecting the people around us? For example, the Bible tells us in the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image. And if you make unto thyself any graven image, the Lord will visit the iniquity upon your children unto even the third and the fourth generation. Does that contradict what the Bible says here, where the Father shall not bear the iniquity of the Son, the Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, but why does the second commandment seem to tell us that the third and the fourth generation, the children have to bear the iniquity of the Father? Again, we are talking about different aspects of sin. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 talks about the guilt of sin. And here in Ezekiel, the Lord was addressing one very specific and narrow point. The children of Israel, they were questioning God. Why are we bearing the consequences of our fathers? When they fell into idolatry, why are we bearing their consequences? Then the Lord told the children of Israel, you are bearing the consequences because you too are guilty. If you were not guilty, you would not have to bear this guilt of your sin. But you too are guilty. You have committed this sin of idolatry as well, not just your father. In other words, there's a very important distinction between the guilt of sin and the consequences of sin. As far as the Lord is concerned, when the father is guilty, he bears his own guilt. When the son is guilty, he bears his own guilt. But the consequences and the effects of sin goes beyond guilt. 
Now we can understand this principle this way. When a father commits or is addicted to gambling and he's a drunk at home, when he returns home and he destroys his family, he alone is guilty for the guilt of his sin, of drunkenness, of gambling, of these forms of wickedness. Yet the effects of sin has to be borne by the family. The impact and the effects of sin is far-reaching. In other words, when God views sin, He sees the guilty party as the one who is guilty. But the consequences and the effects of sin, it is far-reaching. And it can impact and affect even the people around us, those who are innocent. And for the second commandment, one thing also has to be clear. Another reason why the future generation has to bear the consequences of sin is because in idolatry, when the father leads the nation into idolatry, oftentimes the future generation will not be guiltless. They will be influenced, they will be affected by the idolatry of their fathers and they too will enter into idolatry and that is why God has also to judge the third and the fourth generation. So here, in other words, what we see is that there are consequences of sin and these consequences of sin are far-reaching. Even though at times a person may not be guilty, there are effects and impacts of sin that is as a result of the community that a person also has to bear. This just but shows us how terrible and serious a thing sin is. Here, the Bible from verse 14 to verse 16 focuses on the external calamity, the external consequence of sin that Israel has to bear. When they forsook the Lord, they went into idolatry. The Lord has to take them, destroy them by these enemies. There are consequences of sin. But this is where another important truth comes in. This external calamity and this external slavery is really a reflection of a deeper issue. And it highlights the spiritual slavery that the children of Israel was in. These external consequences is really a reflection of their inward state and departure of the Lord. And that is where verse 17 to verse 18 now comes in. And this is our second point. So the first truth we need to realize is that there are consequences to sin. The consequences are revealed. And the second truth is where we see now the consequences are ignored. And what happens when these consequences are ignored? These people were not just in physical and external slavery, but the Bible tells us that when they continue to forsake the Lord, it leads them to spiritual slavery. Okay, look at this from verse 17 to verse 18. Now the Bible here says, Has thou not procured this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way? And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt? to drink the waters of Sihor, or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria, to drink the waters of the rivers? You know, what the Bible is now telling us is that forsaking God will totally destroy you. It will destroy your emotions. It will undermine your freedom. It undermines your will. When God led them in their way, they go about another way to drink. And the effects of forsaking God here is that they will suffer from thirst. They will slowly shrivel up. And this is a most puzzling thing. Now, they were held under slavery by their masters, by the Babylonians. They were held under this physical slavery. But worse still here is the spiritual slavery that they were in as a result of their forsaking of the Lord. 
they are in the land of idolatry. They will be in a place where they will be deprived of God's word. They will be forced to conform into the culture and the ways of the heathen. And these things have far-reaching implications, highlighting the spiritual slavery that they were in. In other words, when we see how the children of Israel forsook the Lord, realize that sin will swallow up a person, sin will consume you with its power, sin has this destructive power where it destroys the will, the emotions, the heart. Sin leads us into slavery. This is what verse 17 and verse 18 really highlights. And the worst kind of slavery is, of course, when they don't even know and realize that they are in slavery. They were in physical slavery. They were in spiritual slavery, but they don't even realize that the cause for their physical slavery is their spiritual slavery. The worst kind of slavery is for a person to be in slavery and not even realize that he is in slavery. Sin is slavery. And there are just two things I'd like to point out here to show you how sin leads them into spiritual slavery. Do you see that they are so irrational? That's the first thing. The consequences in forsaking the Lord, they become so irrational. Now the Bible says here that they are warned. Hey, they are warned not to forsake the Lord. But then they went on to forsake the Lord and then now what did they do? Look at verse 18. The Bible says, Now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt? To drink of the waters of Sihor. Now this word, Sihor here, in English we pronounce it as Sihor, okay? but in Hebrew the I is E. So sometimes we are always quite confused whether to pronounce it in the Hebrew way or the English way. Okay, but it's Sihor or Sihor. But this word here has the root word of dark or to be black. And we believe that this Sihor here describes the river now. And some commentators make a note that the river now has portions of it, in fact, large portions of it, which are muddy, which sometimes gives it a black, blackish color. I do not know whether that is true or not. I've never, I've not gone to check it myself. Okay? But I believe here that this is a deliberate play of words. Why the Bible used the word Sihor, which has the root meaning of black, to describe the waters which the children of Israel are drinking. Because when they forsook the fountain of living waters, they had to look for a replacement. They, had, they went after cisterns. And they went to drink after the water of Egypt. This dirty, muddy water. Why did they go to that? It is puzzling. It is irrational. Irrational. Now, not only that, do you realize and remember who Egypt was? Egypt was this superpower which once held Israel captive. Why are they going back to the very thing which once held them captive? And then, Assyria. Why are they going back to Assyria? Now, we know as Jeremiah was bringing this prophecy to the southern kingdom, Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel has already been destroyed in 722 BC. And who destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel? Assyria. Why would you go to the enemy who just destroyed the northern kingdom for help? Now, of course, they were afraid of the Babylonians. The Babylonians were coming and they were just going about anywhere they, they can find help. But this shows us one thing about sin. Sin leads us to spiritual slavery where it blinds us. Where the more we remain under slavery, we cannot free ourselves from it. And they don't even realize that they are in slavery. They become so irrational. They are unable to reason properly. They make, things, they make decisions that do not make sense. Do you not sometimes see this testimony in many people? Where you, it is most puzzling. You see a person who has been most faithful in church, serving diligently, serving faithfully. And then how? Because of some sin that begins first with the forsaking of the Lord, he would drop everything and just go after it. And then it raises so many questions in your mind. You see that sometimes even of preachers, of pastors. How is it that these people who have studied in the Bible college 
or I have a com had a conversation with a friend and this person was commenting his observation of those who studied in the Bible College at least in Far Eastern Bible College by his estimation he did a calculation and a count and he says that out of 10 students who studies in the Bible College only one or two remains faithful initially I thought that that seemed to be an exaggeration that may be a little bit of an exaggeration but I did a little bit of count and I tried to think back of the classmates that I had through the years then try to think of where are they now where are they serving now some are they claim that, that they now say that oh they are not caught then they are honest in acknowledging it and then they still attend church faithfully that's fine that's different but then there are those who now have simply forsaken the Lord they go back to the world and by going back to the world I mean just completely going back to the Lord they are backsliding backsliding far away from the Lord how is it that these people who have handled the word of life day in day out they have studied the word of truth they can now backslide to such an extent when it's most puzzling most unthinkable why do we hear of examples of pastors who would just forsake everything drop everything give up their whole ministry and just run away to a foreign country living their own life continuing on in sin sin is a most unreasonable irrational thing do you not see how sin blinds you and how sin often leads a person to denial and there's no matter how a person tries to explain sin there's no logic to sin how can this be egypt assyria the water is black the water is dark why do you want to drink of it but this is what sin does it blinds people it leads them into slavery but then forsaking the Lord also leads to a second thing it brings them into a lust you see the word to drink here and now what has thou to do in the way of Egypt to drink the waters of Sihor and then they had to drink the waters of the river now this drink describes their need they had an emptiness they need to feel they had a craving they had a lust it's interesting i'm just going to turn your quickly to a passage in numbers chapter 11 verse 4 in numbers chapter 11 verse 4 Here the Bible described Israel just after coming out from Egypt. This was their murmuring and their complaining. The Bible says here, the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lasting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Again, this highlights the two things. It highlights their irrational mind. They are unable to think properly. They are deluded. They are blind. They saw the manna before their eyes. This manna which is food that is given by God from heaven. They saw it right before their eyes. They saw the miracles of God. They witnessed it. And then they forget all about it and they say, where is the fountain of living waters? I've never tasted of it so sweet. But they have seen it before. They have witnessed it. They see it even right before their eyes. But they say, no, I have not seen it. Irrational. And then not only that, they fell a lasting. That is the word here in Numbers 11 verse 4. Now this word lasting describes desire. It describes the will. It describes the craving. And that is what forsaking does. It brings our will, our emotion under the bondage, this kind of burden and bondage of sin. Where in forsaking, you now say, my soul is dried away. You have forsaken the fountains of living water, so now my soul is dried away. And now I have a desire, I have a craving, I need my soul to be filled. And what did they look for? 
the fish, the leeks, the melons, the onions in Egypt. It's the most puzzling thing. Why do they want to go back to Egypt? When just a few days ago, they were complaining, murmuring that God, why does God not bring them out of Egypt? Yet coming out from Egypt, they now say, bring me back to Egypt. I want the leeks, the onions. This is how foolish they are and this is how their lust becomes so wild. Sin creates this lust. Forsaking the Lord creates this lust in men. When we empty ourselves from the refreshing stream, from the life-giving stream, it creates this burning lust in us that we need to try to find everything in this world to fill. You remember what we learned in John chapter 4? Verse 16 to verse 18, uh, yesterday, the Lord's day, when we considered the woman at the well of Samaria, the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember why the Bible tells us, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Thou hast five husbands, and he whom whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. Why did this woman have these husbands? She had this lust, this burning passion in her, this burning craving in her that she cannot feel and she has no choice but to go to the world to try to feel herself with these things. And the worst thing is, she thinks that this is freedom. She thinks that this is liberty when she's really under the bondage of sin. Do you not see how sin really dries us up. Forsaking the Lord dries us up. It dries us up of our ability to think. It dries us up of our will, of our emotion. And then we soon grow to have this tolerant effect of sin, where we need sin more and more. Soon sin loses its appeal. Soon sin sin loses its appeal in the sense that it loses its ability to satisfy us. When you first enjoy sin, you feel it so pleasurable, but soon it loses its ability to satisfy us. You need more and more and more and more of it. And that is how people will end up in this endless cycle of slavery under sin. Sin brings us into this kind of addiction. Now the worrying thing and the sad thing is, do you know that Christians are no longer under the bondage of sin? When the Lord Jesus Christ saved us, He has delivered us and freed us from the bondage of sin. But why? So many Christians still live as such when they are addicted to these things. Why do they still live as such? Are you an addict to anything? Are you under the power of anything? Is there anything in this world that you say, I cannot live without? I must have it. Are you living with a kind of philosophy? If only I have that. I must have that. I must pursue after that. Are you an addict? I shared this with some of the youths from our church. That the strangest things that we can come under addiction of. Do you know that now smartphone addiction is a real medical condition? In South Korea, actually this was already last year. So now it's not so recent anymore. This was last year where South Korea actually (coughs) officially, seemingly officially declared that smartphone addiction is a real medical condition that people are addicted to. Then they went to do some tests on some young people where for 24 hours they took away their smartphone. And these people actually showed physiological effects of smartphone withdrawal symptom. Okay, some of this physiological effect includes redness of eye. How, how is it that if you take the smartphone away, there will be redness of eye? But somehow it's something missing. Right? My smartphone is not, my smartphone is not, then until redness of eye. <laughs> then another effect of this is phantom vibration. Oh, you know what is phantom vibration? That when you walk and then it, it, they keep feeling the smartphone vibrating. But then there's no smartphone. So how is it that the smartphone is vibrating? And then they keep having this urge to need to reach into their pocket just to check the phone, even when there's no smartphone with them. 
This is the kind of addiction that some people have been brought into. This may seem like a trivial thing. But do you see the power of sin, the destructive power of sin? Where it just destroys, it dries up our will, it dries up our mind, it causes us to make decisions that is most that we would never make when we think that I am making a rational, a very careful decision. But these are decisions that we would think that we would never make, but yet we make them. When we hear of people apostatizing, falling away, how is that possible? Now, the worrying thing is that Christians are no longer under the bondage of sin, should not be under the bondage of sin. But sometimes they live as if they are. There are those who know and they realize and they want to break out of it, yet they go to the very thing which brings them even into such a state in the beginning. Do you realize that if you keep ignoring the consequences, you'll be swallowed up? You keep forsaking the Lord. You keep ignoring this fountain of living waters. And you think your life will go on fine, but it will eat you up. The worst kind of slavery is when a person is under slavery, but he does not know it. And he thinks that it's freedom. That's what youths also have to be very careful for, of. There's a contrast here. In verse 17, the Bible says, He led them by the way. This is what sin does. Okay? The contrast. Do you see the last part of verse 17? He led them by the way. But what way do they want to go to? Look at verse 18. Now what has thou to do in the way of Egypt? And the second part, or what has thou to do in the way of Assyria? They simply want to go a different way. God has led them by the way, but they want to go a different way. And they think that going this different way is freedom. And this is where, you know, sometimes, not sometimes, oftentimes, a lot of these Disney shows, yesterday we talked about musical. Uh, it's interesting because the young people's discussion, actually I learned a lot from the youth because they ask very interesting and relevant questions. And there was also one question that was asked, if musicals are so bad, how about Disney? And what about Disney? And this immediately brings to mind talking about freedom and way, Frozen. Do you know Frozen? Do you remember one of these songs? I did not watch the movie. I did not go and listen to these songs. But what I had to do was go and read again. Go and read the plot line, the story. Go and read some kind of what the songs they sing. And do you know this very, very famous song? Let it go. Everybody is singing it. Even little children, they are singing it. But what is this song about? Let it go. Don't care anymore. Let your hair down. Slam the door. Right? That is what let it go is about. Just slam the door. Don't care. Don't care about my parents anymore. Don't care about my church anymore. Don't care about teaching anymore. Don't care about fellowship. Don't care about service anymore. Just slam the door. Slam every door. And they don't care about God anymore. They slam the door at God. Forsaking the fountains of living water because they think that this is freedom. Just let everything go. And today there are so many youths who have this very strange philosophy that they just do whatever they want. And he said that it's because this generation now, the millennium, the millennials, we are known as the strawberry generation. Okay. Uh, initially, I thought that I was not part of the millennials, but actually it turns out I'm still part of the millennials. <laughs> those who are born in the 1980s, also part of the millennials. Okay? So the millennials are not just those who are born after year 2000. So those who are born in the 80s and 90s and onwards, you are the millennials also. So welcome. Okay. <laughs> Sad to say, we are known as the strawberry generation. Do you know that? And today, there are a lot of people, when they try to look for a job, when they try to look for a course of study, they just do whatever they want. Whatever your heart desires, whatever pleases you. This is a kind of philosophy and mindset today. That's why you would notice that the younger generation does not have this stickability. They will not remain in one place. They will keep, keep hopping from place to place to place. Just go anywhere because this is my freedom, this is my liberty, this is what I want to do. 
in the past, the previous generation, you would notice how parents, your parents, they can take on a job. And even though this job is so difficult, they can stick on this job for years. Why is it that this, this have some this resolve and this resoluteness in them? But this kind of attitude is also seen in the church. They want to have freedom. They just want to do whatever pleases them. That thing that immediately excites their mind. Just go for it. Do whatever you enjoy. Do what you love. And so, sometimes if you don't feel like praying, then don't pray. If you don't feel like reading your Bible, then don't read your Bible. Do what you enjoy. But there's a problem in that because that's not what the Bible teaches us to do. The Bible speaks of a peace that is inward. The Bible speaks of a true joy that is inward, of the spirit. It's not a temporary external kind of joy. It's not a feeling of joy because many times we don't feel the feeling of joy. But there can be a quietness and a joy, a cheerfulness in the heart. That even though we may not feel the external excitement, we still know we ought to do it because it pleases the Lord. It's what the Lord desires of us. There's no this kind of resolve of use anymore because they keep speaking of what I want to do, my freedom, my will. The Lord led them in the way, but they chose a different way. Now, what if someone feels here that this fountain is no longer sweet? If their heart has grown cold, what if you feel that you are like this slave? The biggest kind of slave is when a person is a slave and he doesn't even realize it. What if you have forsaken this fountain of living waters, you are no longer drinking of it, and you still continue in your life as if it is fine, trying to find satisfaction in the world? What if your heart is like that? Your heart has grown cold. Then, the Lord will chastise us. Because the consequences of the Lord has a purpose. And that's the wonderful truth. That's what we see in verse 19. That is where, see, even in the consequences that we bear, the consequences that the Lord brings in our life, it has a purpose. The Lord is still merciful. The Lord chastises us. You know, one of the most disappointing things, I believe, that a person can ever experience in life is this. It is he spent his whole life chasing and pursuing after a dream. And at the end of the day, it is not that he doesn't fulfill that dream. The most disappointing thing in life, I believe, is not when he spends his whole life chasing after a dream and then after chasing, spending years chasing that dream, he does not get it. That's not disappointing. The most disappointing thing, I believe, is when a person chases after a dream. He spends his whole life chasing after a dream. And after chasing it, after getting it, he realizes it doesn't satisfy him. And that's not what he wanted at all. Do you sometimes have that experience? You play a computer game, and then you reach level 100. <laughs> because you think that once I get 100, then there's this feeling of fulfillment. I have done it. And I can share with everyone that I have done it. But then once you reach 100, it doesn't have the same feeling that you thought you had. Of course, that's just a game. But what if it's your life? There are some people who spend their whole life climbing ladders. The worst thing that a person can ever feel in life is having climbed these ladders, reaching the top of the ladder, reaching the top of their career, they realize the ladder is on the wrong building. That is, then they have to climb all the way. But my life is over. How to climb all the way down? I'm at the end of my life already. What of my life? That's the most disappointing thing in life. And how can a person then wake up of this? Someone has to intervene. When this person is pursuing blindly his dream and he's heading in the wrong path, the wrong way, someone has to intervene. Someone has to stop him. And the person who stops him truly loves him. The person who stops him is not somebody who is dashing his dream. 
is not somebody who is arresting his freedom. This person who stops him is somebody who truly loves him. If a person has forsaken the Lord and he feels that the fountain of living water is no longer sweet, the heart has grown cold, what then do we need? We need someone to intervene. And we praise the Lord because verse 19 tells us the Lord himself has intervened. You know, when there are consequences of sin, it is really the Lord intervening. When we experience the chastisement of, due to sin, it is really the Lord intervening. The Bible in verse 19 says this, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy black slidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore. This morning, in the morning devotion, we talk about knowing. Do you see that over, also over here? Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. Know therefore. We need to know. Someone has to show us. And sometimes God has to show us through very painful, very terrible means. Our own wickedness will show us. Now, again, this is not to justify their wickedness. This is not to say that we should therefore tempt God, that we wait until our wickedness rebukes us, then we stop our wickedness. Because these years of wickedness will be wasted away. That is not to tempt God. But here, we are saying and declaring the truth that we thank the Lord that even in our wickedness, in our sinfulness, the Lord uses it to rebuke us, to correct us, to turn us away from our sinful ways, to show us how painful sin is, so that we can know and see that it's an evil thing to forsake the fountain of living water. God sometimes has to use these very painful ways to wake us up, to wake us up of our stubbornness, to show us how much we need the fountains of living water. They have to realize they cannot turn to the Assyrians, they cannot turn to the Egyptians. There's no one that they can turn to for help because the Assyrians, the Egyptians, they will betray them. And when they're left with no one else to turn to, they can only but turn to God. I remember the testimony of a young man who, when he suffered stroke at quite a, rel a relatively young age, this was from my previous church, at about, I think, the late 20s. And so it's relatively young age to suffer a stroke. And we visited him in the hospital. And remember how he shared with us. Sometimes, when you are well, you are walking forward, you do not look up. The Lord has to bring you down. And you have no choice but to look up. After that, for several months, he returned to church faithfully. But the sad thing is, recovering his health, after that few months, he went back again into the world. Does the Lord has to, have to use something drastic to intervene in your life to wake you up? Now, by the great grace of God, do you know that all of us being here is not by chance? I do not believe that how we come here, the time, the money, the energy you spend to come here is by chance. It is by the providence of God. And that is where you need to search your heart most carefully. Has your heart grown cold? Has the forsaking of the fountain of living waters led you to such a state where your heart is now so dried up, so thirsty, and you think that you don't need God but you are really under slavery and you don't even realize it. The worst thing is to be in slavery and not even realize it. And will God then have to intervene in such a way to wake you up? Now the Bible says, God in His mercy, He does. Here the Bible speaks of backsliding. In verse 19, their wickedness shall correct them. 
Okay, the, the weakness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Now, the word backsliding is an interesting word because this word is used 12 times in the Old Testament, only 12 times. And nine times out of these 12, it is used by Jeremiah. The other two times, by the prophet Hosea. Okay, but nine times, it is used by Jeremiah, twice by Hosea the prophet. So the prophets like to use this word, backsliding. And today, a lot of Christians also like to use this word, backsliding. But do you see how backsliding is, an inc- is a serious thing? Because the Bible speaks, you see in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 5, that there are some who have slidden back by a perpetual backsliding. They hold fast deceit and they refuse to return. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 5. Please don't take backsliding lightly. If you know that you are a backs- backslidden Christian, do you realize that this backsliding can become a perpetual backsliding? Are you still waiting for a time where you say that then I will come back to the Lord? Maybe one day in the future, then I will come back unto the Lord. Maybe one day when I'm on my deathbed, then I will come back to the Lord. But your backsliding, is this a perpetual backsliding where you are holding fast deceit? They are deceiving themselves. The Lord says, they are backsliding and the consequence of sin experienced in their backsliding will be a chastening to them. These things that the Lord does in our life is for our own good. My friends, has the Lord intervened in your life? You still refuse to see it? Has the Lord worked? You still refuse to acknowledge it? Now, if you are a child of God, the Lord will intervene when you are backsliding. The Bible tells us, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of His correction. When the Lord intervenes, chastises us, stops us in our track of sin, let us humbly acknowledge the Lord and thank the Lord for that. Because the other alternative is the Lord allows sin to take its full course and that we bear the full consequence of sin. Sometimes we are just like a child, very foolish, very stubborn. Now actually, this afternoon I was talking to somebody. This is actually a classic illustration example. Child wants to go to the playground to play, but it's very, very hot. It's not suitable. If child insists, then what should the parent do? Maybe sometimes when a child is so rebellious and stubborn, just let the child play. And then after that, suffer the consequences. But when the parent stops the child, the child sees it as painful, hurtful not knowing that it's actually good for the child. When the Lord stops us, sometimes even through very painful means, His chastisement, do you not see it is for your good? I'd just like to draw your attention to Hebrews chapter 12 as we think upon this theme very quickly concerning the chastisement of the Lord. From Hebrews chapter 12, and I'd just like to read this portion to you. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 to verse 11. And let us read this responsively. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 to verse 11. (coughs) Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 to verse 11. I'll begin. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. For they verily for a few days 
chasten us after their own pleasure, but He for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. We thank the Lord for His word. How can we be delivered? The chastening of the Lord. And the Bible here says that if you sin and there seem to be no consequences to your sin, nothing seems to be seems to happen. And then you don't care that anything happens. The Lord has a word here. You know, at the beginning of the message, you remember that I say, at times, it may be really in the Lord's mercy that He withhold this chastisement yet that you repent. And we know that in the Bible, there are occasions where God has withheld chastisement when the people repent. For example, in Nineveh, the prophet Jonah cried unto the people, 40 days and the city will be destroyed. And when the people repent, the Lord withheld his judgment. But if you continue in your unrepentant state, you continue your sin and stubbornness, and you see nothing happening, then verse, nine warns, uh, verse 8 warns us, If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. That is, you are not born again. You are not a child of God. Because whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth. Christians, if you have been growing astray and the Lord chastises you, quickly stop, turn back to Him. Thank the Lord for that. Professing Christian, if you profess to be a believer and you live your life in sin, you live your life in the pleasures of the world. You have forsaken the fountains of living water. Your heart has grown cold. But nothing seems to happen. Then, ask the Lord for mercy. Search your heart. Are you truly a child of God? It could be that the Lord has already intervened, but you refuse to see it. You are blind to it. Then as the Lord chastises you, would you wake up now? Would you heed His call? Or would you still continue in your stubbornness? But the wonderful thing is, all of us who are present here tonight, God's Word is given to all of us. We have heard His Word. Do not see it as by chance that you are here this evening. This is God speaking to us through His Word. Somebody has to step in and intervene. If you have forsaken the fountain of living waters, if you are in slavery, somebody has to step in and intervene, and God has, through His Word. The wonderful truth the Bible tells us is if, if we return to the Lord, God will immediately heal us. You know that? That's what we'll see at the end of the camp. But you look at Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. If you have lost your appetite, your thirst for the Lord, you will lose your appetite for everything else. Nothing can satisfy you. But if you return unto the Lord your God, no matter how far your backsliding is, God can heal your backsliding. Would you not say, We come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. So this evening we consider this very important theme of the consequences of forsaking. We see the physical slavery that the children of Israel were led into, the consequence of sin. We see how they despise this consequence, they ignore it which really highlighted their spiritual slavery. Spiritual slavery brings them into blindness. It wrecks, it dries up their mind. It dries up their will. We see how it affects their heart. There is this thirst that they can never quench in them. They will keep drinking of other waters. 
but then we have also seen how the Lord, even in chastisement, in this slavery, will use it to be a rebuke, a turning back from their wicked ways. Now, amazing truth in Israel is that after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, Israel will never return to idolatry. If you go to the land of Israel today, as far as the Jews are concerned, they will never worship idols again. In Israel, it would be the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox churches who have still their idols. But the Jews themselves, they will never return to idolatry again. Somehow, the Lord has used their experience in Babylon to purge them of idolatry. Of course, they still have other issues that they have to wrestle and deal with. They are forsaking of the Messiah. But when the Lord brings this chastisement in our life, we thank the Lord for it. Let us pray. Now, we will cover 13 key well-known denominations. Their timeline and how they split. How the groups form. Okay, so let us turn to your diagram, please. 